This is an AVR, staple of many a home theater nut and budget audio enthusiast. It offers a plethora of I.O. and this one even includes a full set of analog pre-outs. But there's one thing that you won't find on any commercial AVR, and that's a set of digital outputs. Let's fix that. A word of warning. AVRs can be rather expensive pieces of hardware, and their chassis contain potentially lethal mains voltages. While I regard this modification as being quite safe, you might not want to do this unless you have significant prior experience with electronics and know what you're doing. The risk of injury may be small, but there are few things more utterly soul-destroying than accidentally breaking an expensive piece of hardware. Especially when you have no one to blame but yourself. Now look at me. Greetings, nerds and waves. It's been quite some time. So, why would you want digital outputs on your AVR in the first place? Chances are, if you've come across this video, then you already have a use case in mind, but there are actually quite a few fun applications. Perhaps you'd like to turn your AVR into an all-digital audio processor for something like Odyssey Room Correction. Maybe you've come into possession of an older unit and want to use it as a cheap mini-DSP alternative for subwoofer integration. Or perhaps you're a crazed audiophile who wants to make use of a balanced external DAC for active studio monitors. Whatever the case may be, a set of post-DSP digital outputs will make any AVR significantly more flexible. And just to be clear here, what I'm about to show you is applicable to almost any AVR. Now it should go without saying, but you're going to be needing a few things in order to complete this modification. Those things are a Phillips head screwdriver, a soldering iron with a bevel tip, some 0.8mm diameter flux core solder, some flux probably in a pen type thing, some AWG 30-ish stranded wire, ideally in multiple colors for reasons we'll get into later, a WM8804 SPDIF transmitter board with both the M1 and M2 jumpers unbridged, a female panel mount RCA connector, a decent set of HSS drill bits, and the blood of your firstborn. Links to all of these things can be found in the video description, but if you don't already own at least the first two of them, I must direct you back to my earlier words of warning. Now, believe it or not, almost all AVRs share the same fundamental design in the audio department. It's important to have a basic understanding of the signal chain before we proceed any further here, so I'm going to try to summarize it as briefly as I can. This might get a little bit complicated, but stick with it. Back of flowcharts. All of the HDMI inputs on the back of an AVR first pass through what's called a matrix switch. That's a chip with several inputs and one or two outputs used to select the HDMI source. Its output is fed into a video processor responsible for audio extraction, injecting the receiver's OSD and various resolution scaling functions. In other words, that's where all of your input latency comes from. The audio output from this processor is fed to a DSP chip at which point the type of source determines what happens next. If you're watching a Blu-ray movie, for example, the audio will most likely be encoded using DTS-MA or Dolby Atmos. That means it first needs to be looped through a separate decoding IC and then sent back to the DSP. If you're playing music, games, or other PCM content in general, the audio will already be a simple bitstream that the DSP can understand without needing to do any decoding. Whichever path your particular audio took, it's then fed via the ubiquitous I2S protocol in channel pairs from the DSP to a DAC IC, where it becomes individual channels of plain old line-level analog audio. From there, it passes through a multi-channel volume control IC, into the amplifiers, through relays, and finally emerges at your speaker terminals. Now that's the HDMI signal path, but if you're wondering what happens to other digital inputs like Toslink and coaxial SPDIF, they simply skip the video processor and feed directly into the DSP. That was actually the part of the video where I'd hoped to collaborate with the wonderful Alec of Technology Connections, but unfortunately I think he might have missed my message. Oh well, perhaps next time. So, with all of this hopefully understood, an idea might begin to form in your head as to how we could go about getting a processed digital signal out of an AVR. If you guessed the I2S output between the DSP and the DAC, then well done, because you're exactly right. We're going to be using the aforementioned WM8804 to turn that output into ordinary SPDIF. As mentioned earlier, several pairs of channels actually run between the DSP and the DAC as I2S data lines, but today we'll only be adding digital outputs for the front, left, and right pair. Although I expect that by the end of this video, you'll have no trouble doing the rest yourself if you need them. Let's get going. 
The very first thing that we're going to do is find the service manual for the AVR in question. Service manuals usually contain things like schematics, block diagrams and PCB layouts, all of which are absolutely invaluable for this kind of work. In most cases, all you'll need to do is perform a quick Google search for the brand and model of your particular unit, followed by the term service manual. Manuals Lib and Electrotonia are two names with which you're going to become familiar very quickly. Once we have it, it's time to locate the DAC IC. You can do that by following the signal chain through the audio block diagram and taking note of the reference code. In this case, it's IC263. You can then find that reference code down in the schematic. It'll usually be on a separate input board along with all the rest of the AVR's processing, so it shouldn't be too hard to spot. Once you've found the DAC, it's time to take note of the six critical pins to which we'll soon be soldering wires. The first four will usually be labeled MCK, BICK, LRCK, and Data1, which is usually the front left and right channels, but never assume. Different manufacturers tend to use slightly different nomenclature in their service manuals, so if in doubt, it always pays to check the datasheet for your particular DAC. And incidentally, some DACs will have both DSD and PCM I2S as inputs, so if you encounter these, it's the PCM inputs that we want. As for that last pair of pins, you'll need to find a D-ground and a plus 5 volt somewhere on that board. That shouldn't be too tricky, since many of the ICs on these boards actually use 5 volts. Without further ado, let's open up this AVR and see if we can find that input board. Most units should have two or three screws on the sides and a couple on the rear. After removing those, the cover should slide off without too much effort. As expected, it's quite easy to identify the input board, and just as easy to remove it once we disconnect a few JSTs and ribbon cables. Uh, try not to damage those. With the PCB in hand and having found the DAC in the service manual, locating it on the board should be a piece of cake. All you need to do is match the DAC's actual part number in the manual, in this case PCM1681, to the chip on the board. Then you can work out which pins are which. On this particular model, the manufacturer has been kind enough to provide us with easily accessible test pads for all the i s pins, but some other brands won't be quite so accommodating, especially after they watch this video. For example, this other board here from a Denon AVR circa 2006 requires us to make connections to these tiny resistors in series with the DSP outputs. Now, I happen to know that more recent Denon AVRs do provide test pads, but it really serves to reinforce the point that you need to check the service manual before simply jumping into something like this. After all, some people might not be particularly comfortable with making connections to tiny resistors. But switching back to our first AVR, it's time to bring in that little WM8804 board from earlier and make a few decisions before we begin soldering things. Namely, deciding where within the chassis we're going to mount this board. It's a small board and this is a rather large chassis with plenty of empty space, so that shouldn't present too much of a problem. I've chosen a spot directly across from the input board, and I'll mount it sideways here on four little standoffs after drilling some holes. We definitely do not want any metal shavings floating around in here, so I've turned my unit upside down for this part. It's time to measure out four lengths of wire to reach between it and the i s pads on the input board. You can leave a generous amount of slack to make placement easier, but try to ensure that each wire is a different color, otherwise this is going to get confusing very quickly. Strip a couple of millimeters from the end of each wire and solder them between the i s pads on the input board and the 8804. The color used for each pad isn't too critical, but you might want to follow the usual conventions. Green for data, yellow for master clock, blue for BIC, orange for left right clock, red for 5 volts, and black for D-ground. With all of the I2S connections made, we're almost finished. All we need to do now is install the RCA connector. So let's find a free spot for it on the rear of the chassis, drill a hole, and run two wires back to the SPDIF output on the 8804. Then we can tighten down the board. Before we put everything back together, I think a quick test is in order. We'll power on the AVR, give it an audio source, connect an external DAC to that new SPDIF output, and see what happens. Yep, that's definitely audio. Time to reassemble this AVR and have some fun with our new old digital audio processor. So, if you enjoyed the video, please do click that like button. The algorithm likes it when you do that, and maybe consider subscribing. As you might imagine, videos like this one that combine pretty cinematography with rather technical subject matter require quite a lot of time and effort to produce. So, if you'd like to support my upcoming content, you can do that via Patreon. Link in the description. 
that will also give you access to my abundant behind the scenes shenanigans, your name in the credits of all future videos, and a special role on the Weeb Labs Discord server. And did I mention we have a Discord server? You should go check it out, I'm usually around. If you're curious about upcoming content, then I've got three words for you. LEDs, projectors, and tour. But until next time, my fellow nerds and weebs, live long and el psi congruent.